I want to emphasize the importance of rhetoric in the nature of deliberation, particularly, for what we call democracy. We all live in a democracy in this country. There are many democracies in the world. They don't always operate in exactly the same way. The United States has a unique governmental structure. Other democracies often have a parliamentary structure where the head of government as the prime minister is not directly elected by the people but comes from a party and a party uh, that is either completely in the majority or that forms a coalition with another party or parties, which is very common. But in all of these instances, one of the things that is common to them is deliberative oratory rhetoric and writing. There is deliberation. And that deliberation is messy and contingent and controversial. And today we're going to be looking at a couple of issues involving women's rights, the right to vote, the right to life, versus the right to choose. These issues are astonishingly long in their history in the United States. We're going to go all the way back well more than 100 years to look at some of the things that Susan B. Anthony says in congressional testimony in 1887, and I'll read a little of that. We'll look a little at what Margaret Sanger has to say about birth control in 1916. That's 102 years ago. And then we'll look at some more recent issues, including the case argued before the Supreme Court, Roe v. Wade, which is now uh, well more than 40 years ago. But there is still talk today that Roe v. Wade might not remain settled law. There's obviously been discussion about that regarding appointments to the Supreme Court. So you see the stretch of time involved. And you see what's at stake. And if the country was unanimous, or nearly so, or in an overwhelming majority for any one of these positions, they would almost surely have been firmly decided and put away long ago. Such is not the case. That is the way a democracy works. It is contentious. It's difficult. You can get angry. You can be called names. It is tempting to call other people names. It is extraordinarily temp tempting to be uncivil and impolite in public discourse. I think that can work in the short run and not in the long run. History generally is not very kind to individuals who are demagogues, inflammatory, and name callers. Generally not. They often get very far for a while, but not in the long run. So one of the examples I was thinking about regarding this, and I turn to it now because I was going to do something with it last class and we skipped over it, is this um, speech that Al Smith gives about William Randolph Hearst. Do you have it in our own words? Can you find that? So let me tell you a little about, about William Randolph Hearst. He ran a lot of newspapers. The newspapers were sometimes accused of printing what we today would call fake news. They were very vicious. They were very partisan. They conducted what was sometimes called yellow sheet journalism. They were nasty. And they were ad hominem very often in what they wrote. William Randolph Hearst seemed to revel in this to some degree. A famous movie was made about him, one of the most famous movies in American film history, called Citizen Kane. The film was directed by Orson Welles, a legendary Hollywood figure who made the film, I believe, at age 26. Anyone here in VES making films? Well, if you're thinking about it, there's a goalpost, 26, for one of the great films made in American history. Anybody been to Hearst Castle in California, San Simeon? Anybody? Samuel, oh, you're from California. Describe the Hearst Castle at San Simeon on the California coast. It's really big. It's really big. It's really opulent. Yeah. And where did he get all of the things and rooms and objects that are in the castle? Do you know? I 
I don't remember. He hauled them all over from Europe because he had a lot of money. Part of the movie Spartacus was shot at the San Simeon Castle, the old movie Spartacus with Kirk Douglas. So he was very rich eventually. And being rich and owning newspapers, he felt he could push people around, which he did. So Al Smith, governor of New York, is in a somewhat exceptional situation. He's going to run for president, but he has a liability. The liability is he's a Roman Catholic. That's a liability at this time. Who's the first Roman Catholic to run for president of the United States successfully? John Kennedy, yes. John Kennedy, and even in my lifetime, there were objections to Kennedy running for president because he was going to take his orders from Rome. And he had to go before a group of Protestant ministers in Texas to tell them that he was not going to take his orders from Rome. That in his religion, which was private, he would follow it according to his conscience. But in public, he would be a public servant and follow the law. He made a very impassioned address to this group in Texas. You can get it on YouTube, take a look at it. This is not so long ago, not so long ago, that an individual who was Roman Catholic was considered by many to be unfit for the presidency of the United States. I'll tell you a little anecdote about her, so we'll leave the cameras running. My recollection told to me by an individual now deceased who remembers it being told to him by an individual now long deceased was that Hearst came to Harvard as a student and didn't like it. But he didn't like it so much that he decided to give each of his professors a gift. You all know what a chamber pot is? Now that's something out of the past. See, some people don't know, and I don't blame you, you don't know. What's a chamber pot? It has another name, but we won't. You um, put it under your bed, and so you have to you, you know, urinate or you know, defecate while you're in bed, you can do so. Yes, that's right. Chamber meaning room, meaning bedroom. Chamber pot meaning it's a little convenience. Because, you know, people didn't used to have four bathrooms in their homes. They were lucky, in fact, a couple generations ago, even in some parts of the country, if they had one bathroom inside the house, if they had indoor plumbing. So you went to bed. You didn't want to get up, especially if it's cold weather, to go outside or go downstairs or disturb everybody. You had a chamber pot. And then in the morning, you took the chamber pot. Very often, it had a lid on it. You could put a lid on it. You'd take the chamber pot, and you'd go to the bathroom, and you'd dispose of it. Well, Hearst, it is said, decided that he would give each of his professors a gift, a chamber pot. And on the bottom inside of the chamber pot, he glued a picture of the professor. He did not last at Harvard. That is the story. Hearst was a person who liked to attack. Al Smith says, I cannot think of a more contemptible man. You think we play hardball politics today? Listen to that. I cannot think of a more contemptible man. Close to name calling, but not name calling. And is it offensive or defensive? In this case, it's defensive because Hearst had been going after him repeatedly in the papers. And then, Al Smith says something very interesting. Any man that leads you to believe that your lot in life is not all right, any man that conjures up for you a fancied grievance, is breeding the seeds of anarchy and a dissatisfaction more disastrous to the welfare of the community than any other teaching I can think of, because at least the wildest anarchist, the most extreme socialist, the wildest radical, may at least be sincere in his own heart. In other words, may actually believe this may be uh, uh, fully convinced of their argument. But, he says, in essence, Hearst is someone who's doing this in a cynical, completely cynical way. And democracy gives you a great opening for cynicism. Democracy gives you an opening for any kind of attitude. Irony, cynicism, chicanery, sincerity, authenticity. You will all find these in the public discourse of democracy. There they all are. And whose duty is it to separate out the motivations? Our duty. Yes, it's your duty. It's no one else's duty. Responsible journalists may try. Responsible editors and broadcasters may try. And they may regard it as their duty. But does a lot get through? Don't open up your smartphones and your devices. But that's all you'd have to do. 
to see the cacophony of what's available in a democracy. It's now estimated, for example, that up to 60% of many political tweets are retweeted by whom? Robots. Robots. Yeah, nobody. Fake accounts set up by somebody, we don't know who, to retweet and retweet and retweet. Next thing you know, we have a trend. And we all must pay attention to trends. Yes, it's your duty. That's where the buck stops. That is really what a democracy is about. A democracy is not about relying all the time on someone else. Ultimately, it's got to be you. And that's a tough one. Anybody here ever think they read fake news? Anybody here think they ever read fake news at all? Let's see hands. Uh, keep them up. Keep them up. How many of you knew at the time you were reading it that it certainly was fake news? Yeah, some hands go down. That's interesting. That is the atmosphere we live in. Be on guard. It's very hard to develop the filter that separates out what is genuine, what is reliable, from what is not. It's far, very hard even for dedicated news personnel to do it. Anybody here write for the Crimson? Well, if you're writing for a newspaper and you hear a story, do you go run and publish it right away? Well, probably not. What do you look for? What should you perhaps think you might want to look for? The facts. And what if somebody tells you such and such is a fact? What then should you do, perhaps? I mean, you find someone else who agrees or has a corroborating... Co account. Yes. Let's say corroborate rather yeah. than agrees. Corroborate means someone else can say with some independence, yes. So Noor's right. Yes, you better look for the facts. You better just not listen to whatever will of the whisper opinion is in the air. You better look for the facts. But you can't trust usually just one source. Do people who are trying to tell the truth sometimes get the truth wrong? Yes, they do. I've done it. Probably you've done it. Probably everyone in public life has done it. And occasionally the news media does it. Do you ever look at sections of the newspaper that say corrections? Sometimes the corrections are trivial. We got the wrong middle initial of the f councilman we quoted. Well, OK, that's. But sometimes are the corrections a little more significant? Yes. Sometimes they're quite significant. The figure we quoted was not 25 million. It was actually 25 billion. Well, that's an order of magnitude different. <laughs> Newspapers try responsibly to make corrections. So my point in quoting Al Smith is that Smith went through a very tough patch in American politics. He was not elected president. He was attacked by the press. And he had something very interesting to say, which is the whole purpose of this anecdote about Hearst and Smith. I think I've quoted it before, but I believe in it so much it's worth quoting again. Does democracy have ills? Does it have problems? Yes, it does. It does. As Churchill said about American democracy, it's very funny, Churchill was very, he said, the American people will always do the right thing after they've tried everything else. Churchill was impatient that the Americans weren't going to get in on the side that Churchill was fighting on in World War II. So democracy has ills, and Al Smith knew that. It's a rough and tumble game. And he says, the cure for the ills of democracy is more democracy. Now, that may seem strange. That may seem strange. It's like saying, the cure for the ills of taking this medicine that has side effects is to take more of that medicine. It seems counterintuitive. But what Smith is saying is what I heard very recently a former Associate Justice of the Supreme Court say, which is ultimately the force and the power in a democracy that is able to correct those ills is not the judiciary alone. Because the judiciary is appointed by whom? Either the executive or it's elected, usually one or the other. In some cases, it's elected. In some cases, it's appointed. And the legislature agrees to the appointment. 
So a cure is not in the judiciary. An independent judiciary helps, but that's not the ultimate cure. Is it in Congress, a legislative body? I don't know, the current American approval rating of Congress is about 11%. It's been better at times, but it's not the ultimate cure. And is, is it in the executive branch? Is that the cure? No. So this former justice of the Supreme Court said the real cure is, in fact, in the sovereignty of the people. You are going to have to trust the people in a democracy to make a decision eventually about what will correct that gyroscope in a democracy. Because if the people don't do it, if they don't have the trust in their government to be able to exert their force to do it, then all is lost. How, do, how does a population do that? What are the mechanisms by which a population exerts that corrective force? Voting. Voting. That's one. What would be another? Protesting. Protesting, yes. Dissent. What's another? By the way, voting when? Every four years? No. When? Mm -hmm. Whenever you can, yes. If you only vote in a regular election, have you helped make a choice of who the candidates are? No, because you haven't voted in a primary. And then you complain about who the candidates are when you didn't vote in the primary? No, that's not fair. You didn't help pick them. So well, how else? Vote, dissent. Petition, yeah, you can start petitions. But you, you ever sign a petition on a street corner for a ballot question? You can do that. What else? Debate. Yes, you can debate. You can, you can stand on a street corner. You can debate. You can write op-eds. You can express yourself. You can get together a group of people and express yourself. What else? Now, see, if, 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 if you were cynical older adults, you'd immediately have something in mind. Contribute money? Yes, money. Money. That is something that needs to be said, and it's an important thing that needs to be said. And that's a double-edged sword. Do, does everybody have the same amount of money they can contribute? No, they don't. But the courts in the United States have generally decided that within certain limits, you can contribute a considerable amount of money. Can corporations contribute money? Yes. Can labor unions contribute money? Yes. Can PACs contribute money? What does PAC stand for, P-A-C? Don't tell me it's a football league on the West Coast. Political action committees, yes, PACs. So all of these, and we haven't exhausted the list, all of these are ways in which democracy can, through people, affect the course of policy. Who gets elected? who gets nominated, and so forth. And that's really where the buck stops. I know Harry Truman had a sign on his desk in the White House that said, the buck stops here, that old expression. But the buck really stops with the people who have the sovereignty. And the people who have the sovereignty in democracies are the people, ultimately. Philip? Yeah, the legal system. Use the legal system. Americans are very litigious people. Did you know that? <laughs> yes, they are. There are more lawyers per capita in the United States than any other country in the world. I think it's more than twice as many per capita than any other country in the world. Americans love to go to court. The court system is not always very fast, but it's a good thing. I would argue. It's a good thing. How would you feel if you couldn't go to court? Somebody said, oh, no, no, you can't go to court. Our legal system's too clogged up. 